Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Our nation is at a pivotal point in history as we endure the greatest economic crisis in more than a half century. Millions of jobs have been lost. Companies are failing. Americans are losing their homes and states, cities, communities, and families desperately need help. This is the greatest financial crisis since the Great Depression. Answering the call, Congress recently passed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, known as the Recovery Act, which provides $787 billion in tax cuts and federal spending to preserve and create jobs, assist those most harmed by the recession, and reinvest in our great country. I was a proud original co-sponsor of the Recovery Act legislation, but along with the opportunity to heal our ailing economy, we have the monumental challenge of ensuring, ensuring that the American taxpayers' dollars are used wisely and not squandered. The risk of the fraud increases when billions of dollars go out of the door quickly. This is the painful lesson of Iraq war spending and spending in response to Katrina where billions were lost to fraud. Fraud experts estimate that U.S. organizations lose 7 percent of revenues to fraud and waste. When applied to the stimulus package, the amount, this amounts to a whopping $55 billion in American taxpayers' dollars. Mindfully of this history, the Recovery Act provides for an unprecedented degree of oversight and accountability and remedies two of the major problems with Iraq and Katrina funding. The law mandates the use of competitive contracting and the use of fixed price contracts. Further, the newly minted Recovery Accountability and Transparency Board, known as the Recovery Act Board, is designed to provide transparency on how federal recovery money is spent. I applaud the President for his support of these critically important reforms. However, these reforms are not enough. We need to take steps to ensure that problems are fixed before they arise. Two weeks ago, we held a hearing on the excluded parties list of businesses that should have been suspended and debarred, but, but that were still recovering, receiving federal contracts. Last month, the Inspector General of the Department of Transportation issued a report which documented that in 2003, executives were paid $73 million, including the payments of expenses that should have been unallowable, including spa resorts bills, alcohol bills, 45 automobiles, including Mercedes, BMWs, and other luxury brands. Most disturbingly, just yesterday, the committee learned that several of the very first contracts awarded using stimulus funds may have been less than transparent and are contained paperwork errors. At least one of these contracts may have had no competition. Today I will ask that Mr. Devaney conduct a comprehensive examination of this first set of 11 stimulus-related contracts to determine whether the contracts are transparent and if taxpayers' money was spent efficiently, and report back to the committee within two weeks with a full report. I will also ask that this report contain an assessment of the fraud prevention programs that are in place at each agency receiving Recovery Act funding. The sad truth. Once fraudulent dollars go out the door, the federal government historically is only able to collect pennies on the dollar. I also am concerned that states are already beginning Recovery Act spending. However, states have not been told exactly what information to collect. This needs to be fixed, and it needs to be fixed immediately. In order to assess the adequacy of fraud prevention pro problems, I will ask Mr. Devaney to report back to this committee within two weeks his views on whether each executive branch agency receiving federal funds has an adequate fraud prevention program. 
also have major concerns about the administration's primary transparency tool, recovery.gov. The fact of the matter is that recovery.gov is currently not a usable database. I fully recognize the difficulty confronting the administration in this task. With the need to track funding from each federal, state, and local agency involved, with this funding and the need to determine how many jobs have been created. In order for this to work, we need to have uniform standards for collecting and reporting of information. In view of the need to immediately resolve the, this issue today, I will be sending a letter to Vice President Biden urging him to convene a high-tech roundtable or federal, state, and private sector IT leaders to come up with a uniform approach to track and account for Recovery Act funding. We need to come up with a workable solution to what information is needed and what form that information is needed and how that information should be displayed. The national outrage over AIG's decision to give $165 million in bonuses to its employees after receiving federal bailout money underscores the need for a thorough plan for tracking and accounting of stimulus funds and preventing waste, fraud, and abuse under the Recovery Act. I look forward to today's hearing for a thorough examination of the problems that our federal, state, and local watchdogs must overcome. And let us all work with speed and diligence and in the greatest spirit of cooperation and bipartisanism and everything else to make certain that uh, we're able to uh, do the job that the American people are calling for. I want to thank all of the witnesses and, and for appearing here today, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. And at this point, I yield to the ranking member from California, Mr. Issa, for his remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd ask unanimous consent that my entire opening statement be placed in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Devaney, uh, I'm delighted to be here today. I'm delighted to be sitting next to the chairman and, and to endorse uh, and to echo each and everything he just said. We do have a tough job, and we look to you to be the spearhead for this. During the questioning today, I'm going to ask you some tough questions. I'm going to ask you, are you willing to stand up to the vice president as the IG and say that perhaps he is not overseeing properly his job? Are you willing to stand up to each and every cabinet officer uh, who received huge amounts of money with little or no guidance and say that, in fact, either follow-on legislation or additional internal regulations are going to be essential? And the list will go on. I've known you for a number of years. I'm confident that your answers will be good and your efforts will be uh, phenomenal. I uh, have great confidence in you. But I don't have great confidence in the, uh, the body that I serve in here today. The money that you oversee was rushed through in large pots or perhaps puddles of money. Uh, one of the first uh, articles that we're going to be talking about that the chairman referred to here today is uh, quick spending by the, uh, the Forest Service, an organization that, that almost received a full year's worth of extra money but received about half a year's worth of extra money and unlikely will be able to spend it wisely in 18 months. Additionally, you're going to oversee whether these funds are stimulative in their use whenever possible. Uh, it's very clear that there's a spending, spending spree going on by government. Some of it will not be stimulative. Certainly, although the chairman was right to, to note the tax uh, relief that was included in the stimulus package, certainly many of the dollars sent out were sent out knowing that they would not be spent. Additionally, if the government spends its money poorly or if the uh, consistent message, message of the stimulus package is Katrina-like, uh, if I can use that term, uh, the American confidence in our recovery and in, in fact, that that stimulus will, has been used well will slow the overall economic recovery. Mr. Chairman, today we're looking at $787 billion worth of spending. As you noted in your opening remark, and I think rightfully so, we really do begin here and clearly go to TARP funds, government guarantees, and all of the many trillions of dollars that are currently committed and more to be committed because they are interrelated. 
Mr. Chairman, our working relationship has been good in the short time that we've been working together. I expect it to continue being uh, extremely good. And I would note that when you quote President Obama's uh, demand for transparency and you do things like this hearing today to ensure that we begin fulfilling on both what he legislatively did when he was a senator and what he's calling for as a president, we work in the way the American people expect us to work. So I look forward to all the panels here today. Yield back the balance of my time and thank the chairman. I thank the gentleman from California, and I agree with him, and I look forward to working very closely with him in terms of get, uh, getting rid of waste, fraud, and abuse. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, any other members seeking recognition? Yes, uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for fulfilling the commitment of this committee for effective oversight. It is appropriate that we have a meeting today on this stimulus package so that we can not only review what's being set in place to assure that taxpayers' money is not misspent, but also send a message across this country that we take very seriously our oversight role and that we're going to be watching how the money is being spent. The actual spending component of the stimulus package, apart from the uh, tax uh, breaks, it's over a half a trillion dollars. It's an extraordinary amount of money. We're at a time in our country's history where we have an economic emergency, and it's important that we spend the money and get it into circulation. Government spending is stimulative. But at the same time, we want all those who are out there to understand that this money is precious. American taxpayers are putting their faith in us to make sure that we see that money is being spent wisely. And I uh, will join, and I join with uh, the committee chair and a ranking member in an insistence on transparency, uh, that we be able to get the details about how the money is being spent, get it quickly. Uh, I like the idea of, of web pages being used to uh, post information and keep it in real time so that people have the ability to be able to get the information as quickly as they can. But this is our function as an oversight subcommittee. And I want to thank the chair for uh, reminding uh, the American people, uh, that this Congress uh, does care how their money is being spent and that we are going to insist on accountability. And I thank the chair and I yield back. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman for his statement. Yeah. Gentleman from Utah. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I applaud you for holding this hearing. I think this is core to the function uh, of what we should be uh, doing uh, in the United States Congress as a check and a balance, as a uh, true oversight into what's happening in the executive branch. So I applaud you for holding this hearing. Uh, the first of what I believe will be many. And Mr. Devaney, I, I appreciate you being here. You're a brave man. You're a brave soul to take this on. Uh, this is a, a very um, difficult and contentious issue. No doubt you will be uh, uh, tossed around and beaten like a, a punching bag at every step of the way. But please know that there are, the American people are rooting for you, that we need you to do your job despite all the pressures, all the, all the input that be, can be coming from a variety of angles. Um, and I just hope and, and pray that you will remain strong and true to the task at hand in making sure that we hold people accountable and that there is maximum transparency. Uh, I'm a freshman here. I, I didn't create this mess, but I do intend to help clean it up. I voted no on the stimulus package because I do not believe that it fundamentally solves the challenges and things that we were trying to accomplish as it was reported to be about jobs, jobs, jobs. I find that it's not. And immediately right out of the chutes we're already dealing with literally hundreds of millions of dollars that are going to go out, to the door, out the door that the American people fundamentally know is not right. We have effectively with the stimulus and bailouts and those sort of things gone into every single American's pockets and pulled money out, and then started to distribute it to individual companies and organizations and who knows where. I fundamentally have a problem with that because I think it's wrong in principle. But at the same time, the decision has been made. I just want to make sure that we do the very best uh, job to make sure that those funds are used wisely and that there's maximum transparency. I cannot imagine <laughs> how long we're actually going to be after this because undoubtedly there will be fraud and there will be waste and I want to make sure that the United States government is tracking every single dollar and is making sure 
that we give the American people all the information they deserve about where their money is being spent. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Thank you. I'd like to thank the gentleman for his, kind, his words. Of course, I'd like to yield now to the gentleman from Maryland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and the ranking member for this hearing. This is it, the timing could not be better. Uh, as you know, Mr. Chairman, uh, what we have done on this committee over the past many years is that we have a lot of time conducted oversight after the fact. Here we are up front. This money is just being distributed, just being laid out there. Uh, and whether one agrees with the stimulus bill or not, the fact is, is like the, the last gentleman said, it's here. I think holding this hearing sends a powerful message in the series of hearings that you are about to do, that this committee is about to do. Because what it says is that we will do our job to make sure that we look over the shoulders of every agency and every person who may have anything to do with this. But the fact still remains that right now that the Obama administration is in a very difficult situation. They are trying to right an economic situation in our country and as a matter of fact in our world, which is uh, pretty bad. And we need, Mr. Chairman, right now to restore a trust of government and a trust in our economy. And in order for the President to do that, it's like pushing, as I've said many times, a boulder up a steep hill. And when we have situations like AIG, uh, the bonuses that were paid out and the lavish parties and whatever, that simply is like putting a piece of ice while the Obama administration is trying to, 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 to provide economic reform and putting an ice on that, on that hill. Hearings like this gives us a grip to get up there so that not only do we, not only is the money used for what it's supposed to be used for, but it's also done in a transparent manner and is done in a manner with accountability, but more, most significantly, it leads to the American people knowing and, and believing that every dime of their tax uh, dollars is being spent in an effective and efficient manner, and one which will, in the end, Mr. Chairman, benefit them. And so I applaud you uh, for this, Mr. Devaney. We look forward to working with you. I uh, thank you for taking on this role. I know it's going to be a challenge, but I know everything I've read about you, I know you're up to the task and more. May God bless you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentleman from Maryland. At this time, I yield to the gentleman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, like my friend from Utah, I'm also a freshman. But unlike my friend from Utah, I was proud to vote for the stimulus bill. We did inherit an economic mess, and something had to be done. Um, and unlike the previous administration that wanted no accountability or transparency in the TARP program, this administration put the Vice President of the United States in charge of oversight, implementation, transparency, and accountability. I applaud the Obama administration for that, and I welcome Mr. Devaney being here today. Mr. Chairman, I, as you have able, ably stated, oversight and accountability of stimulus money is of paramount importance. In that regard, I was pleased that the uh, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act included specific funding set-asides for management and oversight. However, I believe the manner in which these set-asides were defined leaves much to be desired. First and foremost, the set-asides do not apply to states and localities the very entities to whom much of the ARRA funding will go, despite the fact that states and localities face numerous reporting and accounting requirements. Uh, ARA does, not, uh, does include language that allows agencies to adjust awards to help defray the cost of administration record keeping, but only after going through the formal rulemaking process. This will place unfunded mandates in state and local governments that are already in dire fiscal straits. Secondly, the fact that oversight set-asides are only done on a program-by-program -program basis does not make much sense, it seems to me. Unless there is a comprehensive enterprise component, the end result will be numerous unnecessary stovepipes, the kind this committee has worked to eliminate in the past. Agencies should be encouraged to take a comprehensive approach to oversight of awards granted under the Act. 
I'm eager to hear what our witnesses have to say about these matters. In my view, based on 14 years in local government, the need for oversight and accountability at the state and local level is just as pressing as it is at the federal level. This is truly where the rubber meets the road. Thank you for holding this hearing, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. Thank you very much. Now I yield to the Illinois. Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and let me be very brief. You know, as I listened to my colleagues this morning, I was reminded of having a group of eighth graders in my office, and they wanted to know what was our job? What are we really supposed to do? And I said to them that we're supposed to do four things. One, of course, is to legislate, that is to make laws, determine what is legal, illegal, right and wrong, appropriate, inappropriate. Then I said we appropriate, that is we decide how to spend money and how much of it we're going to spend. But then we also have the responsibility to investigate and that is to make sure that the laws are carried out the way we intended for them to be carried out and that the money is being spent the way we intended for it to be spent and that the American people have a way to trace that money, to actually find out whether or not it's going for the purposes that we originally stated. And I must confess that that is very challenging because there are times when my constituents will ask me what happened to the money. And I'll have to say, well, I know what was supposed to happen with it, but I'm not sure that I can always tell you. And so, Mr. Chairman, I commend you for holding this hearing. I look forward to working with Mr. Devaney and trying to make sure that the American people have the information and the answers that they are seeking. So I thank you very much and yield back the balance of my time. I'd like to thank the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. At this time, I yield to Mr. Turney from Massachusetts. Thank you very much. At this time, we'd like to swear in our witness. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I go answer the affirmative. Let the record reflect that he answered in the affirmative. May be seated. Mr. Earl E. Devaney is chairman of the Recovery Act Accountability and Transparency Board, uh, better known as RAT Board. The RAT Board was created under the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. Recovery Act to provide coordination and oversight of Recovery Act funds, which have an estimated cost of $787 billion. The RAT Board is mandated to audit and to review spending of recovery funds. And of course, uh, I, ask, uh, I tell you, I'll ask you to summarize um, your testimony, because, which will allow us to um, uh, have a period of time to raise questions with you. I'm sure you know the routine. The yellow light means you have a minute left, and the red light means stop. You know, some folks don't get that. You know, sometimes, you know, uh, we have problems with that, but I know you've been around a long time and you understand how important that is. Uh, and then, of course, we will have a time to answer, you know, questions and raise questions with you. We're delighted to have you here, so uh, you may proceed. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today. No, although I have had the honor of testifying before this committee before, I appear before you today in my new role on behalf of the Recovery, Accountability and Transparency Board, as you mentioned, known as the RAT Board, a name of which I had no input. So, um, My testimony today will address the current status and mission of the Board, and, and following my prepared remarks, I'll gladly answer any questions you might have, and I'm sure you have plenty. <clears throat> the status of the board is what you might expect after 30 days uh, after the act was signed into law. Specifically, the, the board is still trying to acquire staff, get our equipment, phones, computers, trying to acquire space, which we haven't managed to get yet, 
and just trying to keep our heads above water and ensuring that the board fulfills its responsibilities under the Recovery Act. Our first official board meeting will actually be held next week. <coughs> Regarding the board's purpose, I view the board as having a, a dual mission. First, the board is responsible for establishing and maintaining a website, recovery.gov, the purpose of which is to foster an historic level of transparency of recovery funds, but to do so, and this is very important, in a user-friendly manner. Secondly, the board will coordinate and conduct oversight of recovery funds to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse. Regarding the website, I have some information to report. Even before the Recovery Act was signed, OMB and GSA had begun designing the architecture and implementing the plan for the website. A great deal of credit needs to be extended to them for their efforts. Because of those efforts, all Americans today can go on the website recovery.gov. As you know, the Recovery Act vests the board with the authority to maintain and run the website. Going forward, I'm eager for the board to assume control and administration over the website, which I don't have today, in order to fully maximize its use of a transparency and accountability tool. Transition of the website's control from ONB to the board's control is expected to take another 30 to 45 days. Although the website is still in its infancy, the recovery funds and the recovery funds have only be just begun to flow. I truly believe the opportunity to ch achieve a remarkable level of transparency never before realized coupled with unprecedented citizen participation. Let me, let me give you some of my thoughts about um, transparency. And uh, I think um, to shorten up my testimony, I'll just say that you know, I've always agreed that sunshine, sunlight is the best disinfectant, and, I, and those words lead me to conclude a few things about this board. The information on the recovery.gov must be easily retrievable and understood by taxpayers, lawmakers, and watch groups alike. Um, we have to find that balance by, between having all the information that's required to follow the dollars and to make it simple so that the average citizen can go on this board, maneuver around, and hopefully be attracted to come back in again. And the public must be given an opportunity to provide feedback and heard. I've been in this business for a long time, and I understand that you know, when you build something, they will come. And if you are not prepared to listen to what the citizens have to say, um, that's actually worse than not having the, the process in the first place. And then finally, barring some certain exceptions of national security and personal privacy, I believe all Inspector General reports, and for that matter, GAO, state and local government reports, ought to go up on this, uh, go up on this website and be periodically updated to ensure that transparency and accountability um, that the Act uh, envisioned is actually achieved. And um, regarding the, the Board's uh, other mission, accountability, there's encouraging news. Even as the Recovery Act was making its way towards final passages, IGs across the federal government were meeting to develop strategies to prevent fraud, waste, or abuse of these monies. The committee may have noticed that I've been using the word prevent to describe the board's mission of accountability. That is very deliberate on my part. Most IGs, including myself, generally spend considerable time detecting fraud and waste and then using either a traditional audit or criminal investigation. It strikes me that although those tools will undoubtedly come into play later on, IGs may be better able to maximize their value to the accountability goal of the Recovery Act by concentrating their efforts on prevention. The language of the Recovery Act strongly suggests that IGs and other oversight entities are being asked, asked to minimize the risk inherent in distributing such an extraordinarily amount of money and to maximize the opportunities to prevent fraud or waste in the first instance before it actually happens. Some of those strategies my fellow IGs have been working on include evaluating as yet unimplemented IG or GAO recommendations, evaluating their agency spending plans and performance measures, conducting evaluations to ensure that proper controls are in place to receive and dispense these funds, providing fraud awareness training to both grant administrators and grantees, developing risk-based analysis tools as an essential part of their preventative work and conducting outreach to state and local audit, the state and local audit community to provide technical assistance, best practices, and training where needed. I want to assure each of you that the board will strive to be as helpful as possible to state and local governments. 
To that end, the board staff will include audit, investigative procurement, and intergovernment professionals who, as part of their job descriptions, will be responsible for fostering a close working relationship with all levels of government. I look forward to beginning the board's mandated role of coordinating with all the other IGs, some 20 plus, who will be more directly responsible for stimulus oversight. I foresee the board actively detecting fraud trends, identifying best practices for conducting reviews, and designing risk-based strategies to help focus all of our limited resources. The IG's well-regarded task force in response to Hurricane Katrina should serve as an excellent model for the new challenge. That effort, which is still ongoing, involved $149 billion and engaged 22 separate IG offices. Finally, I would like to present some of the, some of the impending challenges that I see as having the most impact upon the board and its mission of transparency and accountability. First and foremost is the issue of data quality. Simply stated, the federal government systems have never been fully successful at producing timely and reliable data. Add to that problem the difficulty of transmitting and reporting data up through multiple levels of government as this act contemplates and you begin to understand the basis for my concern. Second to data quality is a lack of adequate number of procurement professionals at all levels of government. Federal agencies in particular will have a great difficulty attracting and hiring enough procurement professionals to minimize the risks associated with moving this amount of money quickly and to accomplish the Act's goals. And finally, I'm concerned that there may be a naive impression that given the amount of transparency and accountability called for in this Act, little or no fraud or waste will occur. I'm afraid that my 38 years of federal enforcement experience informs me that some level of waste or fraud is regrettably inevitable. Obviously, the challenge for all of us charged with oversight will be to significantly minimize any such loss. My promise to the committee today is that my staff, the members of the board, and I will work tirelessly to reduce those losses to the lowest level possible. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my prepared remarks. Thank you for the opportunity. And I do look forward to answering any questions you might have today. Uh, thank you very, very much. Um, uh, I'll start with the uh, questioning. Uh, what are some of the specific measures the Recovery Act Board can take to lend a hand to state and local officials to help assure that stimulus funds coming into their communities are not wasted? For example, does your mandate include providing anti-fraud training to state and local officials? Mr. Chairman, I've been speaking the last two weeks to state and local officials from around the country, and I'm doing a lot of listening. And um, I've been hearing a lot of concern about their ability to perform their oversight role. Um, lack of funding is obviously uh, a major issue for everybody. But um, what I also hear is that they're looking to this board to provide exactly what you just talked about, um, a level of training, fraud awareness training, to help them develop a risk, risk analysis models that might help them focus their limited resources, um, procurement training. And, and as I mentioned in my, in my opening remarks, um, the, one of the charges I'm going to have to everybody that works for me on this board is that a major part of the responsibility is state, state and local interaction. And uh, I've been doing this sort of thing for all my career, and I've always had a, a good, healthy working relationship with state, state and local law, law enforcement and, and audit uh, folks, and I don't intend to change that now. Well, let me just say that I must admit that uh you have a tremendous reputation, positive rep 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 reputation in terms of being able to get the job done. As someone said to me the other day, that if anybody can do this job, it's you. So I, I was happy to hear that. Um, but according to the 2008 report of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, occupational frauds are much more likely to be detected by a tip than by audits, controls, or other means. Do you have a broad plan on how to harness citizen and whistleblower involvement, keeping an eye on stimulus spending? Uh, and uh, also, I guess, along with that, you know, if it, you do, uh, how do you plan to publicize this so that people will feel comfortable coming forth with information? 
Yeah, as you may know, this, this website is getting uh, an average of about 4,000 hits per second. And um, so citizens are tuning in to this website already. And, and we do need to harness uh, the collective wisdom that, that comes from this. I think the, the beauty of this transparency and the concept behind this website provides all of us in the, in the audit or enforcement arena an opportunity to hear and see things that we probably never would find unless citizens called in and told us about it. So we'll have to build a process where we can sort of sift through the, the frivolous kinds of things that, that are always going to come in to the real nuggets. And, and uh, I believe that the, um, the fact that citizens are going to hopefully be attracted to this website and be on it all the time is going to be, we're going to be, find things and hear about things that we never would have found or heard about in the traditional processes that we've all used over the years. I'm sorry. The Recovery Act requires your board to submit flash reports to the President and Congress. I guess, first of all, what is a flash report and uh, why are they important? Well, I think I may be a, a pioneer in that area. I actually um, um, designed flash reports at the Department of Interior to notify uh, the Secretary of some immediate need for their concern. Um, something that was, uh, you know, might involve a potential loss of life or a security issue. And, and so I would use I would use flash reports in this in this uh, in this circumstance as providing both Congress and the administration with something they needed to hear right away, and and not wait for a quarterly report or a weekly report, but just to get it out right away, and, and get that out to the whatever department, for instance, if we have money uh, that might have gone uh, missing or wasted, uh, get that get that out immediately and not wait for the routine reporting process. Senator Claire McCaskill of Missouri has introduced a proposal whereby state auditors who historically do single audits every year as required by the Single Audit Act of OMB Circular 8 A133 would instead do audits directly related to the Recovery Act stimulus money for the next couple of years. She proposes that the initial round of audits would focus on the mechanism in place at the state and local levels. And the second round of audits would be about how effective these mechanisms have been. Uh, would you please explain the concept of single audits and IG's use and, and in terms of how this helps you? Well, uh, first of all, I would commend Senator McCaskill for coming up with that idea. I know she was a state auditor before she was a a senator, so it's a it's an interesting proposition. I know the the audit community, which would include all the IGs and the uh, GAO and their state and local counterparts, have been talking about this in the last few weeks. I don't think we've actually arrived at uh, a recommendation about this, but um, single audits are used to uh, typically to um, to provide audit coverage of monies where you know typically over five hundred thousand dollars. Has, has been expended by an, an entity. I think there are a few states that actually have their state auditors do this kind of work, but most entities are required to hire an outside uh, accounting firm to do those audits. They're funneled into a central clearinghouse at the federal government level, and then if there's a problem, the individual IGs that oversee those areas get involved or get, get, uh, get to look at that uh, and follow up. Thank you very much. I now yield to the ranking member. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as the chairman said, Mr. Devaney, we, uh, we've known of your work at, uh, at Interior, and uh, uh, we're counting on you to do a lot of what you did there. I think the difference uh, at Interior was very well-established programs, the failures at MMS and some of the areas you and I have worked on in the past. These were failures in which the rules were very specific, and they were either violated or we found circumvention through various means, uh, or in some cases, just misconduct by individuals. In the case of, of these funds, isn't one of your problems the fact that the without a, a common set of terms and database, 
if you put the information in and then try to search, if a term for a similar expenditure or a term for a use of funds is not identical throughout the database, although you can maybe get some visibility, you're not going to be able to automate it in an automated fashion search it. I, I think that's absolutely correct. I, um, as I mentioned, I've been listening for the last two weeks to uh, uh, principally state and local officials, and uh, that's one of the major concerns that they raise. Um, you know, I, I need to get control of the of the website. And uh, while I said earlier, I think a great deal of credit should be extended to OMB and GSA for getting this website up. Um, it's going. It's taken me some time to hire the appropriate amount of staff to take control of the website and particularly the website's content. And then trying to understand um, the definitions that have already been uh, sent out to states and, and, and federal entities. Um, sort of, I, I arrived at the train station and found that the train had already left. Um, and it was a pretty fast train, it was going down the track. So uh, I'm going to get my hands around that. And uh, I've heard uh, the concerns. And uh, I want to, as I mentioned earlier, try to strike that balance between having the system um, complicated enough so that we can, we can watch the dollar flow from the federal pot down to the local entity, uh, but yet simple enough so that, and I've been using Mr. and Mrs. Smith from Ohio, uh, can go As a on former Ohioan, I thank you. And, and uh, yesterday I was asked and I told them that Mr. and Mrs. Smith lived in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, can go on that website and, and maneuver around it and be attracted enough to come back to it. Um, uh, quite frankly, I'm interested in making sure that this is a, this is a totally impartial, apolitical kind of site um, that's also attractive. I don't want to put up a sort of a CPA or audit kind of site that wouldn't be attractive enough to, you know, get people to come back in. And, and I want to take advantage of the citizen participation. I look at that, as I mentioned earlier, as an opportunity to learn things we never would learn otherwise. Well, Mr. Devaney, uh, the Washington Post has reported that, at least in their estimate, it'll be a year before that site is searchable uh, based on estimates that they're being given. Uh, last week, this committee uh, held hearings in which uh, XBRL technology and its rollout at FDIC and now at SEC uh, was, was underway. Uh, are you able to, in your current position, explore, uh, that happens to be a not-for-profit, not but groups that could leverage existing knowledge to maybe increase the speed with which, from a year to substantially less, you'd be able to roll out standards that would make this thing searchable? And, and I appreciate the fact you want to make this website look good. I will say that the people I'm most interested in seeing this is not John Q. Public. It's, in fact, the person who didn't get a contract, the person who thinks they should have gotten funds, and will search analytically to, in fact, uncover perhaps the misspending or the redirection of funds that they thought they could have been uh, awarded. I, I, I really need that kind of person. And that kind of person is probably more interested in a, a green eye shade site than they are uh, uh, in something pretty. Well, it, it's, it's a balance again. I'm going to have to find that balance. And I want to listen to um, as many um, innovative technology folks as possible. I mean, uh, second only to the room where I'm keeping all of the resumes that have flowed in are the, is the room where all the vendors have uh, lined up to, to meet with me. Good. So uh, there's, there's a lot of good technology out there, and we need to take advantage of it. Lastly, uh, you know, when Congress passed this stimulus, and, and uh, it's too late for us to point fingers, but uh, we did not adhere to certain truisms, if you will. One of them was now President Obama's uh, legislation that, that called for greater transparency and laid out some of it. We've only gone part of the way. Do you need follow-on legislation or some kind of rulemaking authority that would allow you to get properly through the, the government, the government, the government, the contractor, the subcontractor, the sub-subcontractor? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question right now, but I will tell you that as soon as I figure that out, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to you and tell you the answer to that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Now I yield to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Devaney, um, you know, one of the, I'm, I'm uh, chairman of the subcommittee on the Coast Guard, and we 
we uh, one of the biggest fiascos is this deep water project, and 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 I mean where we've lost, we got we're producing boats that don't float, and we've straightened it out now, I think. But one of the biggest problems were people who had experience with regard to acquisitions, um, and in the Coast Guard, um, and I'm just wondering. Um, do do you think that the let's you know when you look at the stimulus website, it's a question is first of all do states need a website? I'm, and I'm gonna go back to the acquisitions in a moment. Do states need uh, a website? Do they need a a stimulus czar to oversee this stuff? Well, I, I don't know if they actually or do. Need, you recommend one? Need one? I I have been telling folks, and I was asked, I've been asked that question a lot. That if you can afford to do that, I think it's a good idea. I'm I'm of the opinion that the more transparency and oversight, the better. Uh, and say, so are the states telling you that they, while they want to provide oversight, they may not have everything they need to do it? Is that is that what you said a little bit earlier? They they are telling me that. that and they, what can you do, if anything, to help them with that? Are there funds? In the in the budget to help them because I you know one of the things I I, I fear is that we'll have people um, states trying to do the right thing when we consider the fact that states are in bad shape in Maryland we are sending people on furloughs and things of that nature uh, reducing the budget substantially and I'm just wondering we're quickly trying to get money out and it seems that that is fraught with all kinds of uh, possibilities of uh, problems. So I'm just wondering, you know, what, what's available, if anything, on the federal level to help the states? Well, the answer to that is uh, literally almost nothing. And, and um, while the, the act, I think, appropriately and uh, generously funds oversight for inspector generals, it did not provide the similar kind of monies for uh, our state and local counterparts. Um, and I view them as counterparts. I don't think there's a, a, a day that should go by without us trying to leverage our resources, our joint resources, and work together. The last thing we need to do is be redundant. So we need those state and local authorities, whether they're auditors or investigators or prosecutors, we need them to be in a position to work jointly with us. And so uh, I'm, I'm hearing that they don't have the money uh, we've looked at the act uh, in a number of different ways. We don't see a way where we can get them the kind of money they need, so it may take some sort of legislative action. You know, in the frequently asked questions on recovery.gov, uh, it's noted that OMB is not planning to issue guidelines to states, but suggests that agency do, agencies do so. Uh, is there a timeline on issuing these uh, guidelines? Uh, are they required? Should OMB issue uniform guidelines for managing stimulus accounting and reporting instead of an, on an agency by agency basis? Well, the uh, OMB has issued guidelines and they continue to try to refine those guidelines and publish supplemental guidelines. And I think they're using, uh, um, in an effort to get those guidelines out as quickly as possible, the traditional manner that guidelines are proffered and those are those are traditionally done through the agency that manage the funds that are going out. So um, they've used that traditional approach. Um, and um, in my sense is that they are going to continue, that none of those guidelines are cast in concrete, and they're going to be refining them and figuring out if they were the right guidelines or more is needed or less is needed. And I'm picking up on something that the chairman asked about whistleblowers. Um, it's my understanding that stimulus bill goes a little bit further with regard to protecting, I mean, with regard to whistleblowers in that they actually protect the employee of the contractor. Uh, certainly, you know, I'm sure you, you, you may get some disgruntled employees, may get some subcontractors or whatever who aren't getting paid. And I'm just wondering what mechanism do you have or will you have to effectively and efficiently take in those calls, screen them, and do what's necessary to be done. And if somebody calls, where does it go from there? And I see this is my last question, but I appreciate it if you answer. Well, uh, we're going to have to develop a process to do that very thing. And I've got a, I think I've got a, a, a very good history of protecting whistleblowers. And uh, I, for instance, have had, when I was the Inspector General of Interior, a whistleblower protection officer is probably one of the first IGs to do that. So 
I'm very sensitive to this issue. I'm very protective of whistleblowers. And, um, you know, quite frankly, I think with the amount of transparency and accountability we have on this table, we're going to get more, not less, whistleblowers. And uh, I'll work with the other IGs on the board and the other IGs that are not on the board to ensure that that uh, gets treated appropriately. Thank you, gentlemen from Maryland. Mr. Burton from uh, Indiana. Mr. Chavis from Utah. Thank, Thank you. you. And Thank uh, you. I appreciate it. I, I, um, there have been some spectacular assertions as to the number of jobs that would be uh, created or saved uh, through this. Uh, would you be willing to commit to a providing a detailed methodology for the administration's method for calculating jobs saved and created on recovery.gov so that Americans can check the math for themselves? Well, Congressman, I'm. Um I'm going to try and um, ensure that um, whatever the administration's guidelines are uh, for getting information up on that website get, gets up on that website. And uh, with regard to uh, the issue of job, with the definition of jobs created or jobs saved, um, you know, there's sort of the administration's call to do that. I'm going to encourage them to do that. Uh, but I'm probably not going to be involved in the decision making in that because it's an administration call and I really don't think this board and my role is to get involved in that kind of policy uh, sort of thing. I think though that it's, it's clearly a metric that's been thrown out there. I have no idea um, the methodology behind it, um, but um, it's a metric that I think is expected to be tracked on this website. Hey, but. Uh, the information that's going to be used to calculate those types of uh, conclusions would be the information we'd find on that website, correct? Correct. Who, who is in charge? Is it you or is it the vice president? It's a, well, <laughs> I think the president has designated the vice president as a, in charge of the stimulus and recovery funds. And in turn, uh, I'm acting as the uh, chair of this board and reporting to the vice president, but uh, doing so in an independent way. How, how often have you met with the Vice President thus far? Um, three or four times. He, uh, the Vice President committed and said, quote, and we're going to do this, do this once a week as we kick this thing off to make sure we know exactly what we're doing. Is that happening? Um, my understanding is I'm now on his calendar once a week. Has that ha is that happening? It's, it's going to start next week. Uh, but, I, but I've certainly seen him... Uh, as, as much as I needed to, and I've been given assurances that if I need to see him any, at any time, I can. I and can and get what that happens when he, you know we we heard that nobody messes with Joe? Uh, what, how, how does that work? From your perspective in it, dealing it, with this, I think it's working rather well. I I my no, I mean projecting forward, how is that going to work? I think I, I'm I'm. We need to figure out whether once a week is right. Once every two weeks, we're going to try it once a week. Uh, I'm going to try to um, do what I've always done with my secretaries, which is uh, try to uh, have a, sort of a no surprise policy. But I've made it very clear that my intention is to tell him what he needs to know, not necessarily what he wants to know. Um, I'm not bashful and haven't been in the past about telling people things that they don't particularly want to hear. Um, I told him that in the first meeting I had with him, and I got the answer that I had hoped for, that that's what he wants and expects, and uh, we're going to move good. forward okay. with that. Um, will all announcements of contracts and grant competitions and awards be posted online? Speaker Pelosi has promised us that that would be the case. Is that your understanding? That's my understanding. Oh, very good. And uh, I noticed that the Department of Defense Inspector General is not part of the board, yet they're receiving funds. Is th what's your understanding of that situation? You what know, would you I, recommend? I've been asking now for three weeks who, who it was that made up the who made up the composition of the board. I can't find that person. But it, it is true, in fact, that, that uh, people that have uh, um, uh, money, like the Department of Defense IG, are not on the board. Um, some, some people that are not on the board have more money to oversee than people that are on the board. Uh, some people on the board don't have any money to oversee. So I, I really couldn't tell you. What I do know is that each and every one of these board members, has, and I've talked to them each personally, we're going to have our first meeting next week, is committed to the same as I am to, to doing as much oversight as we need to protect the public's what, what, money. What's your number one concern? My number one concern is that um, 
that we be able to respond to the amount of um, citizen information that, we, uh, that we're going to get on this website, and we do that in a way that uh, um, uh, ensures that we, we can get on top of everything that I think we're going to find out. I mean, the citizen participation in this is going to allow IGs and state and local oversight entities to, to learn a lot more than they would through the normal processes. And, and do we have the capacity, do we have the uh, investigative or audit capacity to, uh, to look at all this stuff? It's a lot of money. When do you anticipate actually finding a location which you can be housed? Uh, I'm told I'm going to go look at one Friday. So I'd like to get an address, I'd like to get some phones and computers and, and start taking control of this. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. I now yield to uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Devaney, part of your charge, of course, is to make sure that uh, the money is being spent properly. Uh, do you have any charge with respect to the money being spent? In other words, if this is a stimulus package, and this money is being distributed. Uh, do you know how much money remains unspent? And are there any metrics established for seeing that this money does get spent in a timely manner to, in fact, be a stimulus? Uh, Congressman, my understanding could you, is Could you pull the, that mic closer and speak yeah, a little my louder? My understanding is the information in that's going to be flowing into this website will, in fact, give us that kind of information. Um, I, I don't know that we've been uh, seeing it yet, but it's coming. So, so uh, how, much is, uh, how much has been spent so far? A lot. Uh, I, the first Can you day, quantify a lot? Uh, no. Um, I can't really. Be, uh, I do know that a lot well, this of is money, my question. A lot know, of money went out uh, under formula type of money went out uh, very early on. It, uh, you know, agencies were able to get money out the door quickly uh, to programs that they normally put money into every year. So uh, from a risk perspective, that's, that's probably okay because those are programs that, are, that have processes and people in place to receive that money, albeit it's more money than they normally it's do. It's going out, is it being spent? Um, well, it, it You know the problem we have with this TARP funds, if money goes out, the banks hoard the money. Is this money being spent? Is it stimulating the economy? Do you know? I, I don't know today, and, okay. but I do know that, the, that the, uh, the amount of information that OMB is requiring folks to uh, get back to us with, we'll, we'll talk about those issues. Well, we, you know, this committee needs to know yes. that the money is being spent. How it's spent is, of course, uh, our oversight responsibility. But that it's being spent relates directly to whether or not it's a stimulus. Uh, now, I want to talk to you about the general contracting process. Can you explain why the Recovery Act's emphasis on fixed price contracts will help contain fraud and waste? Well, in general terms, um, there is um, an incentive to contractors under fixed price contracting to to come in with a realistic price and we keep the cost overruns down. Um, our, our historically, if it's not a fixed cost contract, uh, contractors have um, little incentive to, to make sure those costs uh, stay within the within Are a Are you going to be number. examining contracts to see if people are lowballing in terms of uh, competitive bidding? I think that would be part of an audit process that, that uh, we at the federal level, all the IGs and uh, our state and local counterparts. Are you doing. increasing, uh, uh, does the Recovery Act increase mandates for competitive bidding of contracts? It, it, has, it has in place uh, criteria for contracts and, uh, and because it does uh, and because we're going to be able to watch that, we're going to have a quicker response time, be able to respond quicker to those that, that deviate from those rules. Will there be fewer exceptions or waivers granted? I think, I think that uh, the Act contemplates that if there are waivers or exceptions that they be posted I, on the I have website. A, an, I have another broad policy question that I'd, I'd like you to address. Uh, I come from a, a community, Cleveland, Ohio, and, and was mayor of a city where there uh, is a substantial number of minority entrepreneurs. 
uh, you know, our, our African American community in the city of Cleveland is uh, now pretty close to about half the population of the city itself. Now, a lot of these entrepreneurs are, are really not given opportunities to get in on, on uh, these um, on these federal bids. What's being done as part of uh, your charge? And if you're not, who is making sure that um, that minority contractors? who are established and part of a community are given an opportunity to uh, be part of this bidding process so that, the, so that the benefits of the stimulus really get to communities where the help is needed the most and where people have been established and make sure the money gets into the neighborhoods. Well, it's, it's, it's not in the board's mandate to do that. Um, my assumption is that the agencies are going to be working very hard to make sure that that happens. Uh, so it would be the agencies that are giving the money out and the state agencies uh, as the money flows down to the states. So are, are you keeping track at all and see if there's any uh, minority contracting going at all? Or do, you, do you look at that? You're going to keep statistics so that uh, we can know in, in terms of a gross amount of money that might be spent uh, in, you know, in this country going to minority contractors? You know, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll get back to you on that. I'd like to know. Thank you. I re yield back. I thank the gentleman. Thank you, gentlemen, from Ohio. At this time, I yield to Mr. Burton of Indiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In a uh, Wall Street Journal interview, uh, you stated the experts, the people who work in the fraud area, say there will be significant fraud, around 7 percent loss of fraud in most cases. That stimulus bill was 780, uh, 787 billion plus interest, and if you would put a pencil to that, 7 percent, that's about $55 billion, $55,000,000. Uh, 7 percent seems like a very high number. I mean, can't that be improved upon? Well, I think that's the challenge. I think the challenge is that we need to obviously minimize those percentages. I think those percentages, there's very few organizations, the certified fraud examiners is where that comes from. They annually give out those statistics and it goes up and down in a given year. I think that's the 2008 um, stat. And uh, the first time I took a pencil and figured that out, I was horrified to see that it was $55 billion. So obviously the challenge is to, uh, to try to minimize those losses. But it would by, be naive to think that there won't be, with that kind of money around, people who will come and try to defraud the government uh, or state and local entities. So, um, you know, I think we have to expect it. I think we have to have a, a coordinated effort between um, law enforcement at the IG level and state and local law enforcement with prosecutors all over this country right. and, uh, and basically uh, take sort of a a zero tolerance uh, attitude about fraud. Well, I think that's great, but uh, uh, I presume this percentage has been fairly constant over the years. And if it's seven percent of something like seven or eight hundred billion dollars, you're talking about big money. And the American people, I mean, everybody's raising cane right now about 165, 000, uh, 165 million that was given to executives at AIG. If they found out that 55 billion dollars is going out in, in, in fraud almost every year when you have that kind of an expenditure, they, they'd march on the Capitol. I mean, it seems as AIG, as, as uh, in your position, that uh, you and your, your compatriots over there ought to be able to figure some way to get that down to a much lower figure. Well, we're going to try real hard, Congressman. I mean, I, I think that's an unacceptable level of fraud. And um, we're going to try to do our very best to keep it at a minimum. And I think trying to send as quickly as possible as many deterrent messages as we possibly can um, is, is, is one way to try to minimize those risks. The other thing is, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's, um, it's important for IGs and oversight authorities to get on the front end of this pipeline as opposed to simply waiting until that fraud or waste occurs and okay. then doing an audit or an investigation well, and coming along. you've got along. a tough job. Yeah. We have what's called the weekly waste watch. And this is kind of humorous. It says the town of Union, New York is getting $578,661 in Federal Recovery Act funding for a homeless problem that does not exist within its borders. Union did not request the money and does not currently have homeless programs in place in the town to administer such funds said the town supervisor. 
we hope and encourage uh, these new grantees to develop creative strategies for the funding. In other words, they want them to create a program that doesn't exist because they gave them the money. Uh, will you guys be perusing and checking these sorts of things out as well? You know, I, I mean, one of the things that I think that, um, well, one of the things, quite frankly, that I mentioned to the administration is that the, you know, sort of the reverse side of transparency is that people will come and, and look at this website every day. Uh, there's probably not a reporter in America that won't wake up and click on that website. And uh, we're going to have to deal with literally thousands of these kinds of examples. Uh, the good news is that if we didn't have the transparency and we didn't have the website, we wouldn't have found those things in the ordinary course of business. Well, I, I have one more question regarding the transparency. Uh, are you aware that the recent guidance from the administration to federal agencies tells them that they only have to follow the money they dole out as far as the state and municipal level? And uh, after that, the money trail runs cold. Under this plan, there will be zero accountability for any contractors, lobbyists, or special interests that get taxpayers' money. And uh, I think that the ranking member here in his opening statement uh, used the example of Chicago re re receiving stimulus funding from Illinois. And under this plan, the current guidance, we wouldn't find out about any sweetheart deals. Now, this, this uh, website, how is it going to deal with things that go beyond the state and local level, state and uh, uh, community level? Well, I'm going to, um, when I get a chance to get my hands around this thing, I'm going to, my goal is to, uh, what I believe um, the stated goal is, is to follow the dollar from the federal government out to the entity that ultimately ends up with it. And uh, I'm going to do my very best. If the guidance hasn't been issued yet to do that, I will be encouraging folks to do that. So you, you, you want to extend it past the, the state and municipality level? Uh, if it's possible and it's legal, yes. Well, with this 7 percent problem, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, with this 7 percent problem in waste and fraud, I, I hope you go as far as you can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Gentleman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Devaney, uh, as I indicated in my opening statement, <clears throat> the, uh, the Act provides set-asides on a program-by-program program basis for oversight and accountability, uh, but these only apply to federal agencies, not states. Uh, in your response to Mr. Uh, Cummings just a little while ago, you indicated that maybe we would need some legislative relief. Does it make sense? legislatively for, say, this committee perhaps to, uh, uh, to amend the act to allow for set-asides for states so they can do what they need to do? Uh, I would be supportive of anything that gives state and local governments the opportunity to participate fully in this oversight challenge that we all have. So I think the answer is yes. Mr. Chairman, I, I think that's an issue we may want to revisit as a committee in terms of the idea of a set-aside for, for our states to be able to comply with uh, uh, of the full panoply of auditing functions. Um, let me ask a question. Are you concerned about the fact that by going program by program, unintentionally, we may be creating the kind of stove type oversight that actually hasn't been all that useful in the past? Well, I would be uh, perhaps more concerned if we were trying to create a new a new paradigm in that area because of the, the speed that the money is going out. If it's going out in the traditional way, I think the risk is less than if we had, we had tried something new. Now, um, you know, that's the guidance that was issued and that's the way it's gone out and I suspect that there's been some pushback on that and OMB may be reconsidering that. I don't know. Um, let me ask uh, Mr. Devaney, uh, what federal requirements currently apply to states in connection with the stimulus funds? What are they required to do? Uh, they're required to tell us uh, to whom they gave the money and for what purposes those monies are being used. And to the extent possible, the, um, an idea of um, you know, whether or not that uh, created or saved jobs and, uh, and a host of about uh, 80 other things. Among those 80 other things would be some kind of certification that they got some kind of process in place to ensure yes. against waste, fraud, and abuse? Yes, at the outset, right. Um, 
Are state stimulus websites required? No, they're not. In, they're not required. But as I said earlier, I don't. I think it's a good idea. Uh, I'm certainly going to try very hard to to have a website that links to any of those kinds of uh, websites. So that if a citizen comes on the federal website and they want further information, they can simply click on and go to those sites that have been set up. Yeah. If if we were to visit revisit the issue of legislation for set asides. It seems to me websites would also be another way of underscoring the importance of the transparency we've been talking about on a bipartisan basis. Um, would you recommend, uh, well, first of all, are states required to appoint stimulus R's? No. Do you think they I, should be? I think that uh, from what I can tell, most states have uh, created some, some position, whether they call it a czar or not, um, may be an issue, but somebody in every state, and they, they have already come to Washington, is uh, nominally in charge of uh, recovery funds for that state. Um, in the frequently asked questions on recovery.gov, it's noted that OMB is not planning to issue guidelines to states but, the, but suggest agencies do so. Is there some kind of timeline to your awareness on issuing such guidelines? Uh, I would hope that if the federal government is releasing monies to states that those, those guide, that guidance is being, you know, getting out the door at about the same time. But right now you're not aware of any timeline? I'm not aware that there's a specific time frame it mandated. Are the guidelines mandated? Um, the guidelines are, you know, issued by OPM, OMB rather, in the normal way all kinds of guidelines are issued by them and uh, it's a requirement uh, that they follow those guidelines. But the guidelines are being issued on a, uh, by the agencies, are they not? Not they by are. OMB? They are. Does it make Both. sense? There's some general guidelines on, from OMB and there's specific guidelines from the agencies. Okay, depending on the program. Right. Right. Um, in most cases, federal stimulus funds will flow directly to federal agencies, which in turn pass on to state governments. Uh, in some cases, stimulus funds will be dispersed directly to community institutions. Can, can you explain a little bit the circumstances under which money goes directly to community institutions and whether those institutions have the resources to oversee and audit stimulus funds? Well, they may not. Um, there, there may be a requirement, as I mentioned earlier, if it's if those institutions are getting uh, over five hundred thousand dollars, there probably is a single audit requirement, and in most cases, they would have to go out and hire a CPA firm to do that. But there are no requirements for them to do that right now. There are requirements. There are requirements in place that if it's over five hundred thousand, they have to get a they have to get an audit done, single audit okay. done. Okay. So they're required. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Now we recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Duncan. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> in, in some of the uh, recent legislation, we, uh, the Congress voted to raise the national debt limit to twelve trillion one hundred and four billion, a, an incomprehensible figure. And some of us, or most of us on this side, had a problem with the fact that uh, in this stimulus we're spending money that we don't have. That was the main problem. But since we're past that one now, uh, I read uh, uh, recently that uh, in the Washington Post they had an article the day before we voted, and it said it was go uh, that the uh, stimulus, and they were for it, was going to mean a massive financial windfall for federal agencies. Those were the words they used, massive financial windfall for federal agencies. And then a couple days later, the Post had a front-page story that said they were going to hire tens of thousands of additional federal workers. Uh, I, I noticed Mr. Chavitz was concerned about some of the um, uh, excessive claims about job creation. Last week there was a story in a Montana newspaper. The two Montana senators had apparently put out a press release claiming that one $1.3 million grant to an agency uh, in Montana was going to create 40 new jobs and the paper went to that agency and they said no actually they were only going to hire two new people they were going to give raises to the people that were already there and pay other expenses and so some of us uh, have concerns about this uh, uh, how many jobs this uh, thing is going to actually create and another concern is is that night before last on CNN 
they had uh, they said uh, that uh, the private sector lost four million jobs last year, while government uh, created 151,000 new jobs. So while individuals and families and private businesses are having to cut way back, uh, the government keeps expanding. And what I'm concerned about is is that most of this stimulus money is going to be a massive financial windfall for federal agencies first and then state agencies. And then maybe, uh, you, you know, it, it seems that every business, every private, uh, every charitable agency in the country is lining up hoping to get stimulus money. And uh, all the schools are hoping to get stimulus money. And what I'm wondering is, is there going to be some way to track how much of this stimulus, if any, or apparently some of it will, but uh, I'm afraid it's going to be a very small percentage that's actually going to end up in the private sector. And that's where it's needed the most because, uh, uh, for instance, uh, to hire massive new tens of thousands of people in this area, as the Post said was going to happen, this is already one of the wealthiest areas in the country. Do, are we going to be able to tell how much has actually gone to the private sector as opposed just to federal and state bureaucrats? Because it appears that they're the ones that are going to benefit the most from this stimulus package. Uh, Congressman, I would hope that the that the website eventually is able to um, talk about jobs created and jobs saved and give us some idea of uh, where that occurred. Um, I know from um, I, I, I'm I'm a little bit skeptical of the notion that that federal agencies are going to be able to go on a massive hiring uh, binge because this money runs out and the last thing that I personally would want to do running a, an organization is, is hire somebody and then have to let them go two or three years later. So um, I think there might be a lot of uh, retired annuitants that might come back for a while or people that take temporary jobs uh, that have certain expertises. but. Um, we'll see, um, and and I would imagine that we'll be able to tell whether those jobs, where those jobs were created or saved. Well, I was just uh, as quoting what the Washington Post had said, but uh, <coughs> I can tell you that uh, there is a real concern there among a lot of us that uh, not much of this is going to trickle down to the to the businesses and the areas that need it the most. And I think there's going to have to be a major effort made to make sure that uh, uh, most of this money does not is not just spent in areas like uh, this area and like other areas of high federal unemployment, and that really the the main beneficiaries of all this are just the federal federal and state bureaucracies, where actually they're doing far better than businesses in the private sector, as CNN pointed out night before last. Thank you very much. Yes, I'll yield. I'll uh, yield. Mr. Thank you. Mr. Devaney, just uh, a follow-up. When we uh, both sides have talked about the, uh, the no specific funds for oversight uh, for the states and local government, isn't it true that in many, many, many cases uh, are these contributions are cost-shifting? In my own district, uh, they picked a fully funded route and they federalized it so they could use uh, uh, stimulus money and then move those funds to other projects. So in every state, as far as you know, and if you don't know, I'd appreciate a response later, uh, aren't there funds that are being put into programs that otherwise would have been funded, otherwise were funded? So doesn't that give the states the ability, instead of moving a road project funding, fully funded in my district, to another road, they could move it to, to oversight. I just want to make sure that we, we understand that all money is fungible and uh, that we not have uh, any chance that a state literally doesn't have the money, is not shifting any money whatsoever from a project, and as a result would have no money to do oversight. Uh, Congressman, my, my, um, as I've been listening, as I mentioned to state and local officials for the last couple of weeks, they don't, they don't think they can do that, and I haven't heard OPM, OMB rather, tell them that they can. So I, I don't think that they can shift that kind of money to oversight. I don't think there's an ability now, to do well, that. Well, Mr. Devaney, following up, if, if they can shift money into a project that right. was already fully funded right. and they can shift money out, 
then the money they shifted out, which is their money, not federal money, could be used for oversight. Is that correct? Um, I, I think, yes. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I think that could be used. Um, but there's, there's, a, there's a lack of uh, people out there that can, you know, be hired quickly that can do this kind of work. So sure, and, and we can't. It's another challenge. You know, uh, Mark McCormick in one of his leadership books said, you know, anything that any problem money can solve is just a business decision. So I, I wanted to concentrate on the money because we can't necessarily solve the business. But if you find uh, any state which literally doesn't have an example like mine in California, so that there is no ability to make the choice to pay for people if they can be bought, I know this committee would be very interested in making sure that we find a way to get additional funds to that state, but only if there's no examples where funds are essentially being alleviated. Fine. Uh, thank you. And we yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding back. Um, at this time, I recognize Mr. Davis of Illinois. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, and I was just thinking that there are probably other states that uh, do a little Valentine decision making uh, every once in a while when I heard the reference to Illinois and Chicago relative to some contracting. So I'm sure that Valentine's Day exists throughout the country. But uh, Mr. Devaney, let me first of all thank you again for being here. My comfort level was greatly enhanced as we were debating and discussing this legislation by all of the conversation about transparency and how we're going to make sure that people knew what was going on and we were going to make sure that we were watching, that we were going to make sure that the candy store didn't get broken into. That, But we always tell people that. I, I, I mean, every legislative body that I've ever been in, every time we get ready to pass some legislation that relate to spending money, we say that we're going to do it. What? do you see different or do you see anything different about this effort than perhaps we've seen in the past? Well, Congressman, I, I've been in this government for 39 years and I've never seen an attempt made to be as transparent with the money as this act envisions. I actually think if we do this right, it will serve as a model for the future. And I'm, I want to dedicate myself to sort of in the, the autumn of my career to, to, to leave government with something like this in place that can be uh, used for future spending. And um, so we have an effort here that I think is historic in its uh, complexity and trying to do it at the fe federal level. Some cities have done it. Some states have done it. But it's never really been tried at the federal level to, to certainly this amount of money. So we need to get this right. Undoubtedly, it won't be right in the beginning. But as we go forward, uh, we will refine this. And, and once again, I want it to be a model for the future. Let me ask, do you envision your role as being different than that of the inspector generals that we have for all of the agencies? Well, I, I um I, I think that I'm going to, I've decided that I'm going to act like an inspector general. Um, I, I am still one, I'm on a leave of absence, but in this role, um, I'm not going to um, uh, come before Congress or come before the administration and act any differently than I have the last decade as an inspector general. Uh, candid, straightforward, call it like I see it, um, be responsive to both parties. Let me ask, are you going to review the work of agency IGs or state auditors, uh, other individuals and agencies that are looking at, at the expenditures? I don't think I'd use the word review. I think that uh, uh, the role of the board is probably more of a coordination to, uh, to take the work of those uh, IGs, to, to follow it, to take the work, to discern fraud trends, to develop best practices. If one IG is doing something that's really smart and really innovative, 
Uh, I'd like to be in a position to suggest to the other IGs that they adopt that kind of work and, and on down through government. So uh, it's more of a coordination role than a review role. I, I note that the duties of the RAT board include reviewing whether acquisitions and grant personnel are qualified and have sufficient training, which is kind of an interesting addition. If personnel are found not to be trained, what steps would, would, would the board uh, pursue? Well, I think we first have to, to, to do that study and get it, get it out. Um, so that's one of the first things the board, I'm sure, will be uh, trying to get done. Um, you know, and I think that at that point um, it would be helpful to have a discussion with OPM to see if there's any sort of waivers that can be given to retired annuitants as a good example of being able to bring people back. I mean, um, we're going to be essentially um, sunsetting in uh, 2013, so there's about four and a half years here. and. Uh, there's a lot of experience out there that um, that can be tapped into. So things like that. Thank you very much. And let me just say, Mr. Chairman, if I might, uh, I know that Mr. Kucinich raised the issue of minority hiring, purchasing. Mr. Connolly raised the issue of set-asides. I've never been in a place where we actually did what we said we were going to do in relationship to either one of those. and so. I'd really appreciate you uh, looking hard at that issue and, and having a way to examine it. Okay, I will. Right. Thank you very much, gentlemen from Illinois. Let me yield to Mr. Shock. And let me just say that we have a vote on the floor. And what we would do is just, we would re actually we return 10 minutes after the last vote. We will come back to the committee. Yes, Mr. Schock. Thank you. I'll be very quick, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Devaney, thank you for being here. Thank you for your efforts to um, help establish this website and the transparency that comes along, along with it. Um, help me understand, it would seem to me that um, uh, as a part of this act um, and, and the information that we require from the states and local governments in order to get the money, uh, we should already have some kind of a central data warehouse that's got all of the information that um, members on this committee and, and the general public are really asking for. D is that the case? And if so, who, who is the keeper of those documents? Well, I think the, the, the vision here is that recovery.gov will become that, become that uh, place that, that all people can go, including legislators. So it's, it's my hope that, that uh, it'll sort of be one-stop shopping at the end of the day. But does that, does the, I mean, it seems to me a function of establishing the website is already having the information in a data warehouse. And so I guess I'm asking, is that data warehouse already exist or does that need to be created? It's, it's being created and the data will be flowing in, a massive amount of data. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, sort of an historical amount of data being collected in one place. Um, so it has to be created, and uh, it will um, eventually house all of the um, data that's going to come into this website under the requirements. So all of the information that we're requiring the state and local agencies to submit to the federal government will then be posted on this website for uh, individuals like myself and my constituents to be able to review? That's the theory. And, and it's my hope that that will be the, uh, the actual result. What would stop the theory from becoming reality? I think that there's, there's, there's challenges here. The federal, government's, the federal government has uh, never really tried this before. Um, spending, uh, USA spending .gov is a, is, a, is, a, is a pioneer work that uh, happened a few years ago where it was tried. But it's um, and it's up and running well. But it, it does, didn't it didn't involve this amount of money or this complexity. So um, there there are a number of challenges. And as I mentioned earlier, um, you know I'm concerned about data quality. Uh, the federal government's never been particularly good at getting timely and reliable data into their systems. Never mind sending it to one centralized location. So um, 
it, it may be that we get the data in, but the data needs to be uh, scrubbed and looked at with a fine tooth comb. Part of the act requires that um, state and local governments, uh, there seemed to be some question here this morning about uh, beyond the state government, what information we're going to be able to provide to on the website and to the taxpayers. Part of the, the uh, act requires that um, when a local government receives funds from a state government that they submit uh, paperwork that says where the money is going, why it's being spent, what the project is being used for, and specifically uh, how many jobs will be created and so on, and even list a contact name um, in the agency who's overseeing the project. So if we're, all, if we're going to get that information, again, it's required in the statute, should, I'm assuming that information then will be on this site as well? It will. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Gentlemen, yield back. Thank you. I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster. Yeah, uh, Mr. Devaney, um, the, the RAP Board's website is supposed to provide a means for public feedback on the performance of the contracts. And I was wondering whether there will be transparency with regards to the actual public feedback. Um, for example, will there be the equivalent of a moderated blog attached to each contract award? Yeah, I think we're going to have to. Uh, I, I, I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but I, I certainly, that would be my hope that we could do that. Um, but the volume is terrific here, and I think we're going to have to figure out, you know, can we do that and uh, not have to hire 400 people to do it? So we're going to have to um, figure out how that's done, but that's certainly a goal. Okay. Um, and you'd indicated that in addition to transparency for the um, for the actual disbursements, there would be transparency for the grant applications process. So the public can see not only the grants that got funded, but those that didn't. And is this going to include um, the actual grant application material, the full application, or will there be limits to that? And also, will it include, for example, letters of support from elected officials and, and very interesting um, objects such as those? You know, I don't know the answer to that. I certainly get it for you. Okay, because I think it, that would be very valuable if it's possible, because it's... Um, you know, it has to do with transparency and decision making that that would be um, let's see another another thing oh yeah well I understand the benefits of an attractive user-friendly interface will you also be providing the ability for sophisticated parties to just um, pull down the entire um, database so that they can make an independent um, search engine on this or perhaps third parties make even more user-friendly access to your data yeah, I think uh, I think as it evolves over a period of time, there'll be that that um, that capacity. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, visualization tools out there today that uh, are very innovative, and and I want to look at some of those tools because I think it it will provide exactly what you're talking about, rather than sort of a, a standard dashboard where you see charts and graphs and pies. Um, you know, the ability to click on a, for instance, on a map in a state and drill down and get down to the very end of the pipeline where that money is. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm suggesting that by making the entire database um, available for mirroring, that third parties may beat you to this by making really um, cute ideas. You know, you know I think, the, I think uh, we need to get a grip on the governance of this website, and there isn't quite yet a, a, uh, a governance document that's going to govern how that, and that would be part of it as to whether we would make that available. I, I suspect I'm open-minded to that. Yeah. Well, I mean, the alternative is that people will design robots to go and mine your entire database in a very efficient right. manner. And right. If you'd, okay. Um, let's see. The, my next question has to do with subcontractor reporting. And uh, I was wondering how state and local governments have handled the reporting requirements for subcontractors, sub-subcontractors, and so on. Are there states and localities that, that meet um, the federal reporting requirements? And does the, the Recovery Act um, require additional reporting requirements all the way down to the sub-subcontractor? And, and secondly, what action will the RAT Board take if, if these standards are not met? Well, if we, let me answer the second half of that first. If there's a standard or a rule or reg or whatever that's not being adhered to, we will make sure that the appropriate party, be that the agency or OMB, knows about that. Um, 
and um, and and get some action taken about it. Um, you know, I don't I don't think that um, um, I think it's 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 still up in the air about um, exactly how far down this thing can go and should go. Um, and so I know there's discussions going on about that, and we're going to have to make some decisions in the near term about it. Right. Well, it's it's an obvious um, opportunity for fraud to set up a shell company that is the only thing that appears sure. on the website and then have a the real work being done by someone who's not visible. And I'd okay. love to think that a citizen or a reporter or somebody like that would tell us about that if they could see it. Yep. You can only know it if you can see it. Right. And, okay. Well, thank I yield back. Thank you very much. Let me indicate that um, we have three votes, and uh, we will actually adjourn until and come back ten minutes after the last vote. All right.